Good morning. Good morning. I absolutely love that video. Um, I believe that there are deep truths in that video about, um, you know, I'll tell you what love sees when love sees you. Essentially, I'll tell you what love sees when Jesus sees you. Jesus is love. God is love. Here's what he sees when he sees you. I think one of the most fundamental problems in the world is that we don't, in, and even in this room, we all struggle with it. We don't see ourselves, we struggle to see ourselves the way that God sees us. He knows our story. He knows how we're broken and bruised. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly that all of us, you know, no one is completely good. No one is completely bad. We all have this mixture of good and bad choices and ugliness and beauty going on within us. We're very complicated. And Jesus and God sees it all and says, I see it all and I'm willing and I did die for you in order to set you free into a love relationship with everlasting God. It's a beautiful song, beautiful video. Again, it's, it's uh, the gospel. So, we are continuing our run-up to Easter in the series, um, Jesus Up Close. And um, next week, we're a week today. Today is Palm Sunday. Um, if you're not familiar with what Palm Sunday is, a week before Jesus rose from the grave, he and his disciples came into Jerusalem, and there was a spontaneous outpouring by a large group of people of support, of celebration, and a donkey was secured for Jesus, and, and cloaks were put on it, and he sat on it, and on the path toward Jerusalem, people came out and were ye yelling, Hosanna, 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 which means save, saves, and it's an exclamation of joy, and they were laying down palm branches and their coats as a way to pave the way for the new hope that was coming. The one who would set things right. They had heard about and they would seen all kinds of amazing things that he'd done in various parts of the outlying countryside, sometimes in various visits to the city. And now it was the Passover and they were convinced that the Messiah is coming and this one is going to deliver us with power. Political power. Military power. Just like the kings and the governors of old, but greater so, he's going to set all things right and cure all the external ills, the Roman oppression, the injustice in the church, all the external pains that were felt. It's, he's going to do it. Now is the time. And so there was this great external celebration and parade. And everyone was excited and enthusiastic, and Jesus had a moment you know, where some of the religious leaders were like, tell them to stop. They're claiming you to be God. They're claiming you to be the Messiah. And he said, I can't, you know, I, even if I tell them to stop, the rocks will just cry out in praise and adoration. But that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> we're actually going to be looking at a snapshot on either side of that, it's called the triumphant, triumphal procession. Jesus came to Jerusalem and people expected him to be a king of a certain type because their focus was on all the problems and hardships and difficulties in my life are external. It's those corrupt rulers. It's those corrupt religious leaders. It's this. It's that. And they, like us, often fall into the trap of being more focused on the external around us and to blame our misery and our dissatisfaction and our trouble on external things versus internal things. And Jesus is king and did come as king, but as king of another sort to conquer a greater problem that when conquered within and lived out, changes and can change the externals. Jesus is about change, amazing change from the inside out. We kind of often get it the other way around. 
We want things to change outside in order that we feel better inside. And so again, here's this triumphant procession, and we're going to be looking at a snapshot about, basically this is about greatness. You know, they were celebrating his greatness and what they anticipated would be even greater and the benefits to themselves. Jesus shows us in a snapshot beforehand and in a snapshot after what true greatness is about in himself and that we can experience and live out in our own lives. Let's pray and we'll get into the heart of the message. Lord, thank you that looking at you up close is transformative. Because you are God as a human being, and you demonstrate amazing understanding of the human condition, pursuing everlasting love that just doesn't quit, and a power to bring about positive change. And so, Lord, thank you that we can look at you up close. Thank you for the records of you walking this earth in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we happen to be focusing the last few weeks in Mark. Open our eyes afresh. Thank you that the Spirit worked through the writers to show us different perspectives and nuances that we can apply to our life today. Your, Jesus is just the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and will always be. Lord, thank you that you know how we come this morning, what's been going on in our heart, in our lives, and you want the very best for us, and you want to equip us to go forward in the power of your love, in the power of your grace, and in the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to just take a breath right now where we're at. Whether we're here in the room, or whether we're watching on some kind of a screen, help us to take a breath. And say in the quietness of our hearts, speak to me, Lord. I do need to hear from you. That is all of us. Lord, thank you that you're fully capable of speaking right to where we're at, in love and in power. So, Lord, thank you that we can have this confident expectation, and we invite that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, this was a, an interesting week for me, a really kind of busy and unexpected week. And it's very strange because I uh, spent some time in Chicago, rather unexpectedly, and all through the week, every now and then, this phrase would pop into my head before we even actually went to Chicago. Pay for play. Pay for play. Kept thinking of it over and over again. And if you recall, that phrase is often used in politics and other situations where if you want access to the power brokers, if you want those that represent you to take care of your needs or your interests or your projects, you got to pay to play. And, you know, this is corruption. This is, you know, it's not something that we're unaware of. And so that's something that was uh, high profile in Chicago politics 10 years or so ago. A governor was thrown in prison for stuff like that. But it's been something that's permeated the world that if I pay enough or if I extract from people, then we'll, we'll, we'll grease the skids, we'll get things done for you, we'll look out for you. Not great. So that was in my head. And I couldn't really figure it out. And, and I knew that, you know, this was the, you know, Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry, and, and, and I just started looking on either side, and all of a sudden it became clear to me. And when we went to Chicago, I saw two stark differences. And I wrote about it, you know, earlier. And, um, you know, driving in Chicago is tense. And <laughs> we're in the heart of downtown looking for a place to park and missed the, the one that was nearest where we needed to go and knew that just driving around in a circle. So I just turned around and just zoomed down the, this ramp into this parking garage and it was just really close, really tight. I wish I was, we were on my small car, which I really don't care if it gets banged up and stuff like that. But anyway, get down to the bottom of this steep incline. Seemed like it was a 45 degree angle. You're going down into the bowels under these 30 story buildings. You're like, are we ever going to come? And you get down there and the little machine basically informs you that if you can get out in under two hours, it's only going to be $35. <sighs> and you're already down, you know, you're already down 30 feet below ground. You can't back out. It's like, ah. Uh, and so I bit the bullet, 
took the stupid ticket from the thing, and then proceeded to take 10 minutes of the two hours to drive around to find an open spot that our vehicle would fit in. Anyway, and, I, and then also it's like, pay to play. You gotta pay to play. So we go to, the, we go to the museum, and we're walking to the museum, we're getting our methods of access ready. Two of us have a card connected to the Milwaukee Museum, which gets you into this smaller museum for free, which was great, we we're excited about that. One person had to have their entry fee ready. So we get there all ready, ready to make our payment and get our access, and the person, oh, you don't need either of these things. We're shocked. We're having a computer issue today. Our system isn't working. Everyone gets in for free, full access to all the exhibits. Whoa, like that. How refreshingly different. Gotta pay to play, you gotta pay to go down into the dungeon and you gotta get out quicker, it's gonna cost you even more. And here, full access to everything for free. It was nice. Got me thinking about Jesus in the temple after the triumphal procession, when he walked into the temple, a prominent church of their day, and was stunned at the status quo that he saw. That basically, instead of giving as full access as possible for people to experience God's presence and participate in the ritual, the ceremony, and reverence of God, instead of giving full access, which would be incredibly refreshing and incredibly beneficial to all people, instead, there was a series of hoops that were set up, obstacles that were set up in order for you to get in, you've got to do this, and you've got to pay that, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the money changers... Well, we'll get to it later. Jesus was very outraged that access to God's presence and prayer and all that was part of that was made difficult and it was restricted. And so that's why he pitched a fit, turned over the tables, told certain people to get out. He overturned the tables in that church that day. And a few days later, he turned the tables on everything by going to the cross, being dead, and on the third day rising, achieving a victory that can be shared with everyone and everyone. Giving anyone and everyone through faith full access to God's presence and glory. So that's kind of how we got here. So we're going to take a quick look before the triumphal procession and then after when Jesus gets into um, the, um, the worship space and drives out the money changers. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10 and in Mark chapter 11. Would you follow along with me as I read Mark chapter 10, which I haven't talked at all about at this point, but is really a significant preamble to Jesus coming in greatness and power and being celebrated as the one who's going to change things. Follow along with me, verses 32 through 45. They, meaning the group of disciples and Jesus, they were on their way to, up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while others were afraid, or other followers were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him, and three days later he will rise. Pause, pause, pause. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want for me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and let the other sit on your left when you come into your glory. You don't know what you're asking, guys. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And this is great. Oh, we can. We can, they answered Jesus. Which shows an amazing lack of self 
unaware or lack of self-awareness. But anyway, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, and there had to be a tinge of sadness or something in his voice. You will. You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and to sit at my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten, the other ten of the twelve, heard about this, what James and John were up to, hey Jesus, we want one, when you come into your glory, you know, James or John on your right, James was the oldest, probably him on the right, John on the left, you know, places of honor, but the right was more honor. When they heard about this, it says they became indignant, they became irate putting themselves forward ahead of the others. Jesus called them all, you know, decided to make a teaching moment of this, rather than this thing to turn into anarchy. Called them all together. Said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over their people, and their high officials misuse their authority. Not so with you, guys. Not so with you, gals. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Whew. A lot there. This is before. Jesus comes riding in in celebration on Palm Sunday. Let's go back and unpack some of the details here. It says Jesus was leading the way. There's two reactions to Jesus leading the way up to Jerusalem. His disciples were astonished just at his determination, his fortitude, because they all knew there was going to be some resistance in Jerusalem. It, he had freer movement was under less scrutiny in some of the rural areas, but you, when you went into the belly of the beast of Jerusalem, the equivalent of our Washington, D.C., they knew there was going to be opposition from the status quo and the religious leaders, and the disciples were astonished at just his determination to go. And others that were following, they were afraid. They knew the potential for what could happen. And so... He takes the 12, you know, there's a larger group than the 12. He takes the 12 aside and he wants them to know specifically. He said, I want you to know this is what's going to happen. I want you to know I'm full awareness of what's coming. They still didn't really get it. It was only afterwards that they were really able to process it. But so he tells them, hey, this is what's going to happen. We're going up to Jerusalem. Those that are in power there, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the religious power brokers who have their own little military that kind of supports them. I'm going to be delivered over to them. They're going to condemn the Son of Man. He talked about himself in the third person. That's maybe where some of the confusion came. Jesus periodically, instead of saying, this is what's going to happen to me, he'd talk about the Son of Man in the third person. It was a method of perhaps keeping some of these details um, to make sure you were really listening he will deliver it over the chief priests, the teachers of the law. They're going to condemn him to death. And they're going to give him to the Gentiles, meaning the Romans. And the Romans are going to mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. And then he'll rise on the third day. Mark moves along at a quick pace. Doesn't give us much time to process, except for the irony here. Jesus just says this amazing of what's going to, these terrible things that are going to happen to him. And mention that he's going to rise on the third day. And James and John clearly weren't listening very well, or they were really thinking more about themselves. They're on their way to Jerusalem. The expectation is that Jesus is going to come to power. And so for a while now, it would appear that James and John were doing a little calculus and assessing their merit and their worth, perhaps against some of the other disciples, or that now is the time. Now is the time for us to show our true colors and to be where we should be. And so, hey, Jesus, can we talk? Teacher, a term of authority, of recognizing. Teacher, they say. 
We want you to do for us whatever we want. And again, this is away from the other ten. Have you ever had a child come up to you? This happens on occasion. When a child is about to make an audacious request and they know it. Or an unfair request or something that's incredibly selfish and they know it without saying it. And sometimes they'll say, will you, will you, will you answer? You know, will, you, will you do for me? Will you buy this for me? Will you? And, and that, yeah, you know, I'm going to, you tell me, before I tell you, before I make my request, tell me if I'm going to get it or if I, yeah, we, we've all been there. We may not remember, but we probably did it as kids too. Or sometimes we do it as adults. <laughs> Think about this. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we want. Some of the other Gospels mention that James and John's mother may have been off to the side doing some coaching and trying to put their sons. It doesn't matter. They still... <coughs> Jesus, what do you want me to do? May a request. Sit at your right, sit at your left. When you come into your glory, what's going on here? They're wanting a piece of Jesus, this glory that they talk. They want a piece. They may be positioning it so they can look like they can serve him. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll be your first attendance and we'll help you get this done. But what's going on here is they want a piece of Jesus' glory. They want a piece of the power. They want a piece of the status and the recognition. And they're asking for it. To sit at the right hand and the left hand of a ruler, the right hand man or woman, the left hand man or woman, is a big deal. You have lots of power. You have lots of prestige and status. That's what, down deep inside, that's what John and James, James and John are after. He says, you don't know. You don't know what you're asking. I'm about to drink the cup of wrath for all humanity's sin. I'm about to be fully immersed in all of human selfishness. It's all going to come upon me on the cross. I'm going to be fully immersed in it. I'm going to be immersed to the point where I am going to die and be buried in a cave for the sins of all humanity, not for myself. Can you drink the cup I drink? Can you be baptized with this? Can you suffer like I'm about? Can you drink this cup of suffering? Can you give your life over to death for others? No, we can. They didn't know. They're unself-aware like we can be. But knowing what he would accomplish if he saw it through, he knew that one day, as his followers, that they would suffer for others. That they would lay down their lives for others. And so he said, yeah, you can't drink the cup that I am, but you are going to drink a cup of suffering, a cup of difficulty for the well-being of others. But again, to sit on my right or to sit on my left, that's not for me to decide. Even with all Jesus' capabilities, he recognized that there's an overarching sovereignty of God who makes the bigger decisions. And that I'm content with my role. And though I'm going to die for everyone, it's not me to choose who's on my right and who's on my left. Put yourself in that position. Think about it at work. Think about it in the family, where someone that's part of the team up here is angling to ace you out in some way, to put themselves forward above you and doing it in a secretive, surreptitious manner. Now you, we understand what the 10, they says they became indignant, they were outraged. 
So Jesus makes it clear. This angling for position, this angling for recognition or for power that's largely just for yourself and for your own benefit, he says in verse 43, that may be common in the world, but not so with you, my followers. Instead, it's a whole different thing that you're about to witness. If you want to become great, Jesus has no problem with you desiring to be great. You over here, you in the middle, you on the left, or me. He's got no problem with us desiring to be great. As long as we understand it's greatness in terms of how God determines greatness. If you want to be great, I've got no problem with that. But you must be willing to be a servant of other people. You want to be first? That's okay. But you have to be willing to make yourself last in order to uphold other people. And just for emphasis, he knows they're going to see it in living color in a few days. But just for reference, in verse 45, for even the Son of Man, even God coming as a human being, he did not come to be waited on, to be served, or to be fawned over. He came to serve others and then to give his life as payment, as ransom for many for their sins. The message to them is clear, the message to us. It's very important that we move from do for me, do for me, do for me, God, do for me, Jesus, to you've already done and you're doing for me. You've already done through crucifixion and resurrection and doing through the activity of the Holy Spirit. We need to move away from childish, immature, lack of big picture of things, do for me, do for me, do for me, God or Jesus, to focusing in on all that he's already done in giving us physical life, physical breath, forgiveness of our sins, various people of influence, positive influence in our life, blah, blah, all... We can get so focused in our culture and in our soul. It's not the culture's fault, it's, it's in the heart. We're never satisfied, never enough. And we can get so focused in, and they were like, hey, Jesus, do for us whatever we want. You know, it's the equivalent of treating Jesus like a magic lamp. And give us our wish, Jesus. We need to move from do for me, do for me. It's not that God doesn't care about your needs. He does. We can talk with him about that, which becomes quite clear in the second half after. But if we're all about do for me, do for me, do for me, and have lost perspective of all that's been already done and that's going on, we need to grow. And if we want to be great, we become great by serving others over self-promoting. Self-promotion is the rage of this generation, of this culture. It has been for a long time. It's just more prominent now. Will we serve others in obscurity, with lack of recognition, committed to the well-being of others, rather than building our brand or self-promoting in some way? Greatness, according to God and Jesus, comes from serving not self-promoting or self-angling for position. Okay, so this is then, after this little, then Jesus goes on the triumphal procession into the city. And in verse 15 of Mark chapter 11, where he's now in Jerusalem. And so it says, I'm reaching Jerusalem. You know, before we get there, I was reminded about this, you know, James and John's audacious request, do for me, do for me. When I was a younger guy, I really wanted a bicycle for Christmas. Really, when I, and I knew exactly the kind I want. You know, I had a, a bike that had the banana seat and the up handlebars, but now I was bigger, you know, and I'm like, boy, I really wanted, you know, the bigger bike, bigger frame, and then had the ram, you know, the, the, I don't know what they're called, ram handlebars? They go, curl over. Because it was sporty, it was, it was what others had. So Christmas came, and woke up that morning, and there was a bike, and it was a big bike. 
much bigger than the one that I was riding around on. But it had upright handlebars. And it had fenders. Ah! And while I was delighted to have a bike, my dad could see the disappointment in my face, though I held it in, but you can't cover some things. And I don't know if I mentioned something about the handlebars or something about, but, but what about, but what about, and my dad took me aside and said, we're not sure that you're ready for that yet. Leaning over, said, but I talked with the salesperson and there's a conversion kit that's readily available so that when you're ready, and you've had some practice on this, we can be converted over to that type of bike and the fenders can be taken off. And I was like, <sighs> Still disappointed it didn't happen on the time frame that I wanted and it didn't take that long. But there's a part, even though there was this generous thing made available to me, there was a part of me that was very ungrateful very demanding and wanted it exactly the way I wanted it in the time frame that I wanted it and forgot that my dad knew me and that my dad loved me and was always watching out for me and though I didn't like it when he said we're not sure you're ready for a bike this size Jesus didn't say to James and John you're not ready yet remember they said oh we can we, we can handle whatever but he knew that one day they would be ready, and that's why he said, you will drink the cup. You will suffer for others. You will put your life on the line. Sometimes God's timing is different than ours, and we don't like it. But that's how we grow. We can grow in trusting him. Now, on to Jerusalem. So he comes to the big church in Jerusalem. They called it a temple, but it's the equivalent of our church. And on reaching Jerusalem, he entered the temple courts, walked in there, and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called the house of prayer? 700 years, sorry, 600 years before Jeremiah had written about a problem that was going on in the nation of Israel that people from other nations, peoples that believed and trusted in the God Jehovah, they were, their access was being restricted. And there was all kinds of this type of shenanigans going on where people weren't getting the access to God that they should. And so Jesus is quoting from Jeremiah 600 years before. My, you know, God saying, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. Instead of a sanctuary where people can worship God, can hear from God, receive from God, you've turned it into a marketplace in a way for people to be exploited and so that they feel like they can have access to God, which we'll get into in a minute. In verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, what Jesus said, and began looking for ways to kill him. For they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The crowd had tuned out years ago on the teaching of these Pharisees. Because the crowd knew that the Pharisees looked down on them, considered themselves spiritually, morally, in many ways superior to the masses, and let them know that they were the privileged who had access to God and the benefits of God and will dole out morsels to you here and there. When their job was to make access to God and His love more available, more accessible. And so they were angry and wanted to kill Jesus because they feared him, because people were amazed at his teaching and were gravitating around Jesus. And they were losing their following. They were losing their status. They were losing their power. Even though Jesus wasn't doing any self-promotion, back to the details of the turning over the tables.
First of all, when people came to the temple, they were, whether they were regular Jews or, heaven forbid, they should even be foreigners who came in and wanted to worship at the temple, they were treated that, well, because you're an unrighteous pagan or because you're a sinful person, your money is corrupt. It's no good in the temple. It'll defile the temple. So your money has to be exchanged for temple money. Of course, there'll be a small handling fee. And then when you've exchanged your dirty, foul, and unclean money, because you can't bring that before God, as you can't bring yourself before God, when you've exchanged it for a small or a large handling fee, then we'll take the now clean money, and you need to purchase a sacrifice. Some type of an animal to be sacrificed, a bird, something bigger. You know, depending on our assessment of your moral worthiness, you know, if you're kind of swarthy looking or you look like a foreigner, you're going to need a bigger sacrifice to get in to God's presence. So it's going to cost you more. And so this system of hoop jumping was set up and it was exploitative. If you didn't look like you were much of anything, clearly you don't have the blessing of God on your life. You've got to pay more. If you're a foreigner, or you talk with an accent that's not quite the, the establishment of Jerusalem, it's going to cost you more because you're not, you're less worthy. And so this had become a system of exploitation. And it enraged Jesus because God's arms are always open wide and will readily welcome anyone who comes to him in faith and humility. And so he overturned the money changers that was this conversion of dirty money to clean church money. Those that were selling the doves for sacrifices and other things, or maybe other spiritual trinkets and merchandise in order to somehow get yourself in good standing with God. Notice this whole thing doesn't operate on grace at all, or the benevolence of God. Basically, it's pay to play. If you want access to God, if you want your sins forgiven, if you want this, if you want that, if you want your dreams and God to pay attention to your dreams, Fork it over. Fork it over. And it enraged Jesus. My house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Not just the elite. Not just the select. Not just those that are well healed. But for all people. So the takeaway for us from this portion is it's a really important that we cherish, truly cherish, the ready access to God's love that we have in Jesus. Because, you know, the sacrifices that were being sold there, you know, that you had to buy in order to get access, in a few short days, Jesus would become the ultimate sacrifice that would purchase complete and total access for all of humanity. We need to cherish the ready access to God's love that we have in Jesus through his sacrifice. And then we need to share it readily with others. Cherishing ready access to God is about talking to him and praying. And oftentimes when we pray, and it's okay to pray, God, change my external circumstances. I don't know if I can deal with this much longer. It's way bigger than me, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's relational, whether it's whatever it is. We often pray for God to change our circumstances, and that's okay as long as we also pray, God, change me. Because sometimes God will change our external circumstances, but oftentimes what is needed is a change in here, in our heart, in our soul, and God will give us the strength and the peace to bear up under difficult circumstances. Remember, Jesus is about changing the world from the inside out, not from the outside in. So if we cherish our ready access to God in Christ, and fully utilize it. That it's not just an ornament. It's not just a decoration on our mantle. But we pour out our heart and our soul. And our hopes and our dreams and our disappointments. We commit ourselves to learn and to revere God. Change happens within us. And change can happen outside of us. 
But you know, if we're not taking advantage of this, if we're not fully utilized, if we're not cherishing this access that we have in Jesus, we've got nothing to share. Or not much anyway. That's the point. Jesus was enraged that these people were not given access. Now we as his followers have been given this access. We ought to cherish it. We ought to utilize it and then share it readily. It's about greatness that serves. Remember in verse 45 of Mark 10? For even the Son of Man, even God who became a human being, did not come to be served, waited on, or fawned over. He came to serve others. That's greatness. And as a demonstration of that, he went into that temple, tore out the barriers, and then a few days later, tore down all the barriers when he allowed himself to be crucified and then was risen on the third day. This is greatness that he shares with us. Let's take full advantage of this full access. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that as we read this passage in this text, we can be reminded of ourselves. It makes us uncomfortable when we see James and John approach Jesus and say, do for us whatever we want. In the demanding tone of a child that has no clue. It makes us uncomfortable because in many times we can be like that with you. We want you to become our instrument to accomplish the life that we want. When what is most fulfilling and what we're designed for and brings the most benefit in the world is that we become vessels and instruments of your goodness and your love in the world. We, got it the, we get it the wrong way. Lord, would you help us where we're at in our areas of feeling alone, in our areas of feeling overwhelmed, in our areas of feeling like we've got, we don't know what we can do. Would you help us to approach the full access, approach you with the full access you've given us and talk your ear off and listen to your voice that we might be transformed from the inside out by your love, by your grace, by your forgiveness. Thank you for your victory. Help us to live in that victory and share it readily with the people around us. Help us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, please stand and we're going to sing our closing song with the worship team.